Recently, I came across this awesome Veritasium video called Math Has a Fatal Flaw. Now, I'll let you watch the video to figure out what the fatal flaw of mathematics is, but in it, Mr. Veritasium brought up something really mind-blowing that I never knew before about Conway's Game of Life. So for those unfamiliar with Conway's Game of Life, it is a cellular automation with a few simple rules. Cells are either marked as dead or alive. Each generation, they reference all the neighboring cells, that is any cell up, down, left, right, and on all the diagonal corners. Any cell with less than two neighboring cells will die from underpopulation. Any cell with two or three alive neighbor cells will continue to live. Any cell with over three alive neighboring cells will die from overpopulation. And any dead cell with exactly three alive neighbor cells become a live cell from reproduction. Now from these few simple rules, some pretty spectacular patterns can emerge. And John Conway always considered this a zero player game, a, a game that can basically play out on its own and you can just kind of sit back and watch it unfold before your eyes. But of course, we as humans love to manipulate things and so people have done some pretty spectacular things inside Conway's Game of Life. Um, Conway's Game of Life is actually considered Turing complete, which means you can actually make a Turing machine inside of Conway's Game of Life, again, just using these few simple rules. Um, some people have actually even built like actual computers, actual functioning computers that can calculate different math functions. Again, just using these simple uh, couple little rule sets here. But the thing that really blew my mind that I learned from this Veritasium video is that you can actually play Conway's Game of Life inside Conway's Game of Life. Now, someone actually created this thing known as an Octa Metapixel, which is this 2048 by 2048 grid sized, uh, basically version of a cell in Conway's Game of Life. And you can basically just use that as a single cell and combine it with you know many other of these Octa Megapixels to basically play Conway's Game of Life inside Conway's Game of Life. And when I learned about this, my head just about exploded. I thought this was like the coolest thing ever. Um, and my mind also immediately went to, you know, how can we actually create this with Unity's data-oriented technology stack? Of course, because Unity Dots is focused on, you know, high performance, multi-threading, and being able to handle, you know, millions and millions of entities, I thought that this would be you know the perfect use case to really stress test out unity's data oriented technology stack um, by you know seeing how big of a conway's game of life i can make using it so for starters i kind of just started planning some things out on the whiteboard basically getting an idea of some of the things that i needed to create um, you see that i've put up a little graphic on the board where it's a grid kind of broken up into a few sections now, this is something that I didn't actually get around to implementing during this iteration of the Turbo's Game of Life, but I do want to use this project as a way to experiment with how data is laid out and how I can actually improve performance um, in many different ways. But I think that's gonna actually have to wait until the next video before I get that fully implemented. So once I kind of have a good plan of what I needed to do, now is about time to get started working on the project. So I started just by creating some simple little cell prefabs for the alive and dead cells and kind of getting the coloring set up. Um, and then what I did is just basically sp spawned a grid of a bunch of the dead cells. One thing that I was paying attention to during this part of the process was the chunk utilization. So in Unity's entity component system, basically entities are stored in chunks, which are 16 kilobyte basically blocks of memory um, where all these entities are stored contiguously. And so the one thing that I was paying attention to is how many entities could I fit in a single chunk? So literally just these, you know, blank cells that have nothing on them other than a rendering component and a translation component to basically, you know, position them uh, somewhere within the game world. You know, I can only fit 55 of these entities into one chunk. And again, this was before I had any other data about, you know, whether the cell was alive or dead or if there's any other things that I wanted to store with that. Um, you know, that would only, adding all that data would actually only decrease the amount of entities that I could fit in one single chunk. Now, I want to maximize the number of entities that I can fit in a chunk basically to optimize for cache hits. So if I can fit more entities into one chunk, then when entities look at each other, if they're all within the same chunk, then that's going to be a cache hit. So that's going to be a much faster access than if I were to have to, um, you know, search for an entity that's not in the cache and, you know, take a look at that to determine if it is alive or dead. So to maximize the cache hit rate for this project, I've actually decided to use two entities for every single cell on the grid. So there's one renderer entity, which is basically just, you know, what you see right now, where I actually have 
the uh, visual representation of the entity and then it lives physically somewhere in our world now the other entity is basically just the data entity and all this does is keep track of the xy position as well as a boolean variable for whether it's alive or not and so this is just a super lightweight data entity it doesn't actually have a translation component because it doesn't need to live you know physically anywhere in our world um, and so this way using this I can have over 500 of these entities in a single chunk So that's 10 times more than just the visual component alone So then basically what happens is I go through all the data entities to determine whether a cell should become alive or not And then after all that has been calculated then the renderers can basically just reference the you know Same cell that they reference and determine whether it needs to be set as an alive cell or a dead cell So now it's about time to start actually getting things working within Conway's game of life first thing that I wanted to do is just basically make a way for me to kind of easily interact with the simulation. So I basically just have set up this little system where I can just, you know, click on any cell and then flip that between a dead or a live cell. And then so, of course, you know, some some of the OG Turbo Makes Games viewers will recognize this little um, old school TMG logo here. Now it's time to actually start implementing the rules of the game of life. And uh, that shouldn't be so bad, should it? You know, despite these little funny graphic little issues that I had, um, implementing the game of life was actually pretty simple. There was just a couple things wrong with my logic that was causing this to kind of like bug out a little bit like this, um, which is always, you know, funny to look at. But now at this point, I basically have a working version of Conway's game of life. And I think I was only about, you know, two or three hours into the project at this point. So it really was not all that difficult to get to the point where you know i have some basic conway's game of life working but then i started to add in some more features where i could basically you know like play and pause the iteration as well as just kind of step through generations one by one um, and also increase or decrease the rate at which these generations occur and so at this point i could basically just you know click a bunch of random cells and then just sit back and then watch the game play out before my eyes so you know this was you know super cool at this point and i was i was pretty happy with my progress that i've made so far only problem is it didn't really scale too well. So again, to just kind of put things in perspective, my goal was to kind of simulate the game of life within game of life. Now, again, these like Okta metapixels, what they're called are a 2048 by 2048 cell, which takes over 35,000 generations to basically turn on and then turn off. But what I had at this point, you know, when I would scale up to a size of just 500 by 500, and I was only just, you know, simulating a few little pixels changing on the screen at once, I was getting performance of less than five frames per second. So I, you know, really had to kind of dive in and figure out what was going on here. Now, the number one problem was rendering. The program was literally just slowing to a crawl. Like it was really just, you know, bottleneck. Um, and you could just see this like massive spot in my profiler for the rendering. And at this point, I was getting a little nervous. I thought I was going to have to make like, you know, maybe my own custom rendering script or something like that. So I started kind of reading through some of the documentation about the hybrid renderer. And I was like, you know what? Let me just give the hybrid renderer v2 a shot you know i i usually just use the hybrid renderer v1 just because it's um you know the kind of the default one but i switched to the v2 version and it literally just making that one change instantly increased my frames per second on the 500 by 500 grid to 60 frames per second um so i was just like oh okay and actually up until this point i hadn't even been multi-threading my code yet everything was still just running on the main thread so i basically just converted my jobs to multi-threaded ones and then there i was already up to 200 frames per second at 500 by 500. so just those two changes were able to you know bring performance up to a much better level the next thing that i want to do is actually check build performance because um, you know, performance is always going to be much better when you're doing a build of a game rather than running it in the editor. By the way, I will include a link to a build of this project down in the description below um, so you can, you know, play around with it and have fun. Now, performance in the build was really great. I was basically able to, you know, max out the frame rate of my display, which is 144 hertz for, you know, some much larger scale of entities. Um, however, you know, going up to 2000 by 2000, it was kind of still performing like a little bit on the slower side. And then I, I kind of wanted to actually like, stress test this. So I, I basically made a way for me to 
uh, kind of just like randomize all the cells on the grid and then kind of use that as like a starting point for the whole game of life to simulate. Because um, previously I had just been kind of testing just by, you know, clicking a bunch of little pixels on the screen and you know that wasn't really going to cut it for a good stress test and then when i did this on the larger scales you know i was really noticing the program coming to a crawl the main problem is the way i originally had the cells changing colors i was actually just changing out the material on the render mesh component now problem is because the render mesh component is a shared component this is actually a structural change um, if you do want to watch my videos where i talk about shared components you need to ECS, I'll leave a link, you know, up here and down in the description below. But that was basically causing another bottleneck in my code. You know, all these, you know, millions of entities at this point actually had to basically run on the single thread. So it was kind of like, you know, back to the drawing board, how can I actually multi-thread this code? So the solution I came up with was actually a little bit different. Basically, the first thing I did was I spawned a background entity um, to basically be the size of the entire grid that I want. And then I set the material properties on the background grid. So the grid material kind of like lines up with all the cells. But then what I did is actually spawned a green alive cell for every single cell on the grid. And then I have those actually placed behind the background grid. And then whenever the cell is set as an alive cell, then it moves in front of the grid. So it basically gives the appearance like that cell flipped from, you know, on to off. And the reason that I'm doing this is because I can actually multi-thread physically moving those um, alive cells in front and behind of that background. So at this point, I basically have, you know, everything multi-threaded. Of course, there's a couple little bottlenecks that I might need to work through here and there. Um, but that is basically what I have right now as far as the current state of the Turbo's Game of Life project. And so take a look at the performance. Now, there's still a number of performance improvements that I'd like to make for this. And by all means, I am open to suggestions about how I can improve this project, or if there's any you know other things that you want to see me try to see if this you know might improve performance or whatnot. Um, I'm totally open to all that. Um, I'll certainly also be revising this project in another video soon, like I mentioned. Um, like I kind of want to play around with how the data tiles are actually like laid out in memory um, to really optimize for those cache hits. Because, you know, at this point, if you kind of think about it, you know, when I actually scale to a larger size, all these entities are basically just going to be, you know, in one single column. And that's not necessarily the best optimization for cache hits because you know when they look you know above and below them of course that's going to be a cache hit but when they look at entities you know on either the sides or up and down diagonally then those are going to be in different chunks which is going to be a cache miss so if i can kind of you know like optimize it and basically break these all out into squares most of the time I'm going to be able to get cache hits when I'm checking other entities. And I also wanna play around with some things like the rate at which the systems run. Um, so right now, basically the system is running at a maximum of one generation per frame. You know, I wonder if I can, you know, play around with some things where I can basically have you know, like maybe like eight generations run in the background for every one single generation that's actually drawn to the screen. Or, you know, maybe I can do a bunch more than that. Because again, you know, if I wanna actually get to the point where I can simulate the Octa Metapixel, um, you know, again, that takes 35,000 generations to basically turn on and then off. So anyways, those are some things that I kind of have planned for the future. But if you do want to mess around with the Turbo's Game of Life, you can go ahead um, and check down in the description below. I'll have all the project files, code, and build files down there for you to, um, you know, bust apart and tell me how bad my code sucks and just, you know, have fun with. But anyways, that's going to be it for today's video. I really hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd really appreciate it. If you hit that like button, also feel free to subscribe to the channel for lots more videos about Unity's data-oriented technology stack and their entity component system. Of course, if you do have any questions for me or suggestions for future videos, you can always leave those down in the comments section below. Anyways, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next one.